I've been uh, working with uh, Friends of Balboa Park and now Forever Balboa Park for a number of years. It's my backyard and I'm really excited to share it with you today. Um, this, this is just a map of Balboa Park. I wanted to let you know what we're gonna be doing. Uh, I'm gonna give you a, a little bit of history of the park and then we're going to be touring the gardens of the park. Most people only get to the central part of the park. There are actually three distinct areas of Balboa Park, uh, and they have um, very distinctive names. Over to the right, the area is called East Mesa. The area where all the museums are is called Central Mesa, and the other side of Cabrillo Bridge is called West Mesa. So we'll start in the central area. Uh, we'll go over to the West Mesa and then we'll swing around to the East Mesa of the park with, with these gardens. Balboa Park is uh, started as 1400 acres. Some of that's been carved out with the zoo and the um, Naval Medical Center, um, but it is a third larger than Central Park as Judy mentioned. So here are three key people uh, who actually arranged for and set aside Balboa Park for the citizens of San Diego. Uh, to the right is Mr. Marston of Marston's department store. He was quite a philanthropist. He worked very closely with all kinds of civic uh, doings. In the middle is Mr. Horton. I uh, you know him of Horton Plaza. Alonzo Horton set aside the central area. It was called New City. And to the left is someone you probably haven't heard about quite so much. His name is Ephraim Morse. And it was actually Ephraim Morse's um, idea that with this new territory that was set aside for San Diego, that they take nine of the plots and um, designate those in perpetuity for the citizens of San Diego. And this is what we have as Balboa Park today. Um, and they worked very closely with Kate Sessions, our mother of Balboa Park. So if Ephraim Morris is the father, Kate Sessions is the mother. And this is what it looked like. So as you can see, um, I think they really didn't think that they were giving a whole lot away. Um, this is Balboa Park from Date Street. Um, and it's, it doesn't exactly look like our native areas because this is after 75 years of um, Spanish rule in the area, it was, the native vegetation was uh, stripped and uh, it was used to graze cattle. There were uh, interesting institutions that were there, the city dump, the dog pound, and that kind of thing. That was how it was used from 1868 until people started saying, no, we need to do more with this. And this is the very first Arbor Day I, it was in Cabrillo Canyon, as you can see, horse and wagon. The community was a small community, and when something happened, everybody got together and worked on it. So this is the first Arbor Day, the trees were planted, and all of the trees that were planted had to be hand watered. There was no water, there was no irrigation system. So horse and buggy, buckets, uh, and this was the beginning of the development of Balboa Park. Then there was an inspiration. Uh, <clears throat> the Panama Canal was nearing completion. The city decided, wow, we're the first city in California uh, to, for the ships which come through the Panama Canal, we're gonna put together an exposition. We, San Diego actually started the planning for this first 
San Francisco, unfortunately, got the federal funding. They had a little bit more political pull than San Diego. And these intrepid citizens of San Diego said, that's okay, we're gonna do it ourselves. And they did. So this is one of the booklets for the Panama California Exposition, 1915, the city got together, everybody pulled their own weight and they had a vision. So it was a very expanded vision. As you can see, it didn't exactly come uh, together like the boats of Venice, but fairly closely. And you can see all of the trees that have been planted, they're now taking hold. And um, in 1915, this was just a tremendous project for a fairly small city to take on. But they did it. Um, most of the buildings for the exposition were considered temporary. There were only four buildings that were permanent buildings, but of course, then the Cabrillo Bridge was part of this. It was called the Garden Exposition, and there were gardens throughout the entire exposition. Um, when the exposition opened, uh, a number of the workers uh, donned green outfits and were still planting the first days of the fair but it was a wonderful, wonderful celebration of the fact that now the East and West Coast were, were a much easier to access and San Diego was right on top of it all. The icon, one of the iconic buildings of the exposition, of course, was the Laugh House, um, which was an, a true inspiration. Most cities have a glass house or the cities at that time would have a glass house for their exotic plants. Um, but we had um, a horticulturist here who said, look, with our climate, why do we need a glass house? All we need is a little bit of shade and we can grow almost anything. So San Diego got a laugh house. Um, I don't have a picture of it as it looks currently because all we, all we can see right now is the skeleton as it's being restored. But this was one of the first and iconic buildings and has remained an iconic building. This is another picture of the exposition. And I love this picture because it really dates itself with the, with the biplane. Um, and I'm sure the picture was taken from a different biplane. It included orchards, it included gardens, it included all of the industrial um, innovations of its period. It was quite an event and it was so well liked that it went on not just for one year, but for two years. So this really set the stage for Balboa Park. Um, it was the, from this beginning that Balboa Park really started to thrive. And some of the basic gardens that were set up within, there were two expositions, um, one in 15 and one in 35, but the gardens included Alcazar, Palm Canyon, one of the greatest uh, collections of palms at that time in the world. Uh, the Cactus Garden, the Palisades, the Plaza de Panama. Um, so we're, I'm going to take you on a tour of these gardens first. The California Tower was one of the four permanent buildings in the exposition and we have it with us today. It's, a, it's an iconic building, it's a beautiful building in the park. So we come across the bridge to the Alcazar Garden. Um, and this has its Moorish conception. We have uh, with Forever Balboa Park, a uh, volunteer group now of garden stewards and um, on numerous times a month, the garden stewards help to care for gardens, this one in particular, because it's one of the only formal gardens in the park. 
uh, that requires weeding consistently. And it's far too much um, for the staff uh, of Balboa Park. So we really depend now on the garden stewards and um, they're a really fun group. Uh, we're gonna have another training on Saturday. I always work on the training with them. Um, and it's really nice for people to be able to get out and to work in Balboa Park and participate in the park that we all love so much. This is looking the other way at the back of the Mingay Museum. You can see this is, this is a formal planting. It's seasonally planted. Um, I talked to the horticulturist today. He's getting ready uh, and planning for the next planting, the um, late winter planting. The Plaza de Balboa, um, I think many of us can remember when this was a parking lot. And um, this is a tremendous improvement. It's considered now the um, kind of the, the um, patio of, of our uh, park. And it's used with great frequency and much joy. Uh, with El Cid in the background um, and the organ pavilion. And the trees in the containers are being re replanted now. There's another view of it. <clears throat> One of the programs that I've been able to work with is called an Adopt-a-Pot program. And this was started at the centennial of the um, of the first exposition. And we invited groups throughout San Diego, um, gardening groups, horticultural societies, um, plant groups, architect, landscape architects to participate for a year to plant a garden in the park. And this area around the fountain was planted by the Dahlia Society. And they did this actually for several years and it was really beautiful and far more work than uh, the staff at the, at the um, park can, could handle, but it made a beautiful display for the time that they were doing this. And it was greatly appreciated. There'll be other areas that I'll be talking about that have been adopted plots over a period of time. It's an ongoing program, if you know of any groups and it's under this program that we were able to do the work that we're doing in Balboa Park over at Bird Park. This is another area that's adopted a plot. Um, if you've been to Balboa Park in the winter, this is where Santa and his sleigh uh, are, are set up. Just recent, this was a very successful adopt a plot because um, it didn't depend on flowers for the color. Prior to this, it had been seasonal gardens like Alcazar, um, but with the permanent plantings, the, the leaf color and texture created that ongoing interest in this particular garden. This is uh, a garden that you may or may not be familiar with. Um, it, as you go around from uh, the area where the Oregon Pavilion is to the west uh, and south, uh, there's the Balboa Park Club. And behind the Balboa Park Club is the Cape. It's recently been designated as the Cape O'Sessions Cactus Garden. And for the 1935 exposition, Kate actually designed this garden. It's one of the ones we know that she designed. The planting is not her plantings anymore because um, plants are ephemeral, but it has been kept as a cactus garden. It's been recently renovated and it's a really beautiful example of desert plants. Here's, a, here's another image of it. And it's one of those hidden spots in Balboa Park. If you know about it, it it's a wonderful collection of plants. And um, 
a nice place to walk where it's rather quiet and not, not quite the hubbub of some of the Central Park area. Of course, there's the Japanese Friendship Garden. Um, this garden has been under development and is continuing to be developed over a time period. And it is an absolutely magnificent garden in the park. Um, it goes down into the canyon uh, and uh, it's just exquisite. So it's well worth a visit to the Japanese Friendship Garden. You can see peaks of it from, from the top of the canyon, but as you go down, it's really a beautiful, beautiful spot. Continuing around behind the House of Hospitality, there's a small area that's the Cafe Del Rey Moro. Uh, it's the, the Del Rey Moro garden patio. And this is, uh, this is designed as the Moorish gardens were, where there's a, a continuing water feature. So it starts with a fountain, it goes to a stream, then there's a pool, then at the end, there's a, a wishing pool. Um, it's very formal. There's not, there are not as many plants here, but it's really a lovely spot. Continuing around behind the hospital, the house of, of um, hospitality. This is one of my favorite spots. And some people, a lot of people are not familiar with it. This is called the water carpet. It's the oriental water carpet and water actually flows over the tiles, um, creating sound in addition, sound and movement in addition to the art that's there. If you turn 180 degrees, you're looking toward uh, the botanical building. So there's, there's a pathway, there's steps, and uh, Cindy Benoit uh, did the design for this, for the centennial. Um, and she did really a lovely job. Moving on. There's the Zorro Garden. And I know Holly's familiar with the, the Zorro Garden. In the 1935 exposition, this was an exceptional garden. Um, and we'll have a sign for that in a, in a minute. This has been designated as a pollinator garden uh, for butterflies and insects. It has some challenges because the Morton Bay fig tree that is beside it provides a lot of shade for that garden. So the plants are there for to pollinate, um, but as I said, it's a bit of a challenge. This is, this is what it was, uh, and we have a sign that designates it. Friends of Balboa Park uh, has created a number of signs throughout the park. And if you haven't seen them, they're worth looking for with information about various areas in the park. But um, the Zorro Gardens in 1935 were a nudist colony and Queen Zara reigned in the garden uh, and there were lots of activities. If you go beside um, the, um, if you come down the walkway that's to the left on, from this image and go down Zorro Canyon, you'll see a number of native plants. Um, Debbie Gordon, uh, Lee Gordon's wife, designed this garden to highlight the design elements of native plants. And she's done, she's done a beautiful job. Um, and it's a very, very successful garden in the park. And a number of our members uh, helped to maintain this area. Um, the horticulturist of the park was so impressed that she invited Debbie to design the triangular area that's to the right uh, of this garden uh, to match it. So it's really a, 
a lovely um, example of native plants in Balboa Park. I'm sure a lot of people who walk by the garden don't even know that they're native plants, but um, we do. Here's that, here's that triangle um, just after it's been trimmed. But it's back in a corner beside a parking lot. Okay. Moving across the Prado, um, this is behind the Timken Museum, uh, facing the lily pond. Um, this was again an, an adopt a plot. It was created by the San Diego Horticultural Society, and uh, it demonstrates the drama uh, and color of, uh, of exotic plants. And it's very appropriate to buy the Timken, which is the only really um, modern museum in the park, uh, very different from the other gardens and very different uh, sighting for it. It's really a beautiful display. There's another image of it. And then we have uh, at the base, at the foot of the lily pond, coastal sage and botany for kids uh, has maintained this um, seasonal garden uh, ever since we first started the Adopt-a-Plot program. And this, this, I believe it's every Saturday, um, they're working on this plot adding plants um, and keeping it up. It's a, it's a lovely spot. It's one of the most photographed spots in the park. And they're doing it even though the, the botanical building is a skeleton of itself at the moment. Um, we really appreciate coastal sage gardening working in this area. Inside the botanical building, there were wonderful, wonderful horticultural displays, um, which in a couple of years, we hope they'll be back again. The Morton Bay fig tree is an iconic tree in Balboa Park. Friends of Balboa Park uh, worked, it took, I think it was either five or six years uh, at the bequest of Parks and Recreation, um, it, there was uh, a kind of funky chain link fence around the park. We raised funds and Pat Coy was the designer of the deck that's now under the Morton Bay fig tree so that people can once again get up close and personal to this wonderful tree, which so many people in San Diego love. Going across Park Boulevard to the south, we have the Rose Garden. And the Rose Garden is currently um, being modified and expanded. Uh, it has, it's one of the top 10 Rose Gardens in the world. And I believe it's next weekend uh, or all of next week, they will be pruning all of the roses in the garden. Uh, the top roses each year are added to the garden. It's, um, it's an amazing, amazing collection. And the Rose Corps uh, have worked on this garden for many, many years. Um, I am constantly, gratified uh, at the volunteerism that uh, supports Balboa Park. It's really just amazing. And um, it just contributes so much to our wonderful public space. If you go to just to the north, again, this is on the east side of Park Boulevard, is the Desert Garden. The desert garden is different from the cactus garden. It's a much larger garden and includes plants of more varieties, um, but it has wonderful pathways and very fascinating uh, example of horticulture from around the world, uh, from deserts from around the world. So uh, that's the central mesa. I don't know if you can see my my uh, cursor, 
but that's kind of the central mesa um, that we've walked through. And you all know the zoo, that's, that would be a lecture in itself. Um, to the right, there's Florida Canyon and to the left, there's Cabrillo Canyon. So we're gonna go back across the bridge and start up uh, at the north end of um, Balboa Drive and come down Balboa Drive and see some of the gardens in the West Mesa. They include the Marston House, the Trees for Health, um, and just a number of other really interesting places that you can read about yourself. So, uh, the Mar as mentioned initially, uh, George Marston was a very strong supporter of the park and bequest, his home was bequested to the um, Balboa Park and um, Parks and Recreation maintained the grounds and um, the Save Our Heritage organization uh, has taken over the management of the home and they do have tours. Behind the house, this is the lawn area in the, in the front of the house, but behind the house, there's a formal garden that includes a rose garden. It's a very intimate area. It's a very pretty area that's worth uh, exploring. Coming south, there's the Trees for Health garden, and they have a little um, kiosk uh, that talks about the garden itself. Every Friday morning, uh, volunteers are working in the Trees for Health Garden. So it's a great time to go and talk, talk to people about what is in that garden. Um, all the plants in the garden are plants that have some kind of uh, nutritive or um, medicinal um, benefits to mankind and these include uh, plants from all over the world, um, including some native plants. I know there's a, a, a Bevins Mahonia there um, and they're, the people who work in that garden are very knowledgeable. And there is some signage uh, if you're there when they're not available to talk to. And there are tours from time to time too. That information is at the kiosk. Oops, there's another image. Moving south, uh, this area is called Cypress Point. Uh, Balboa Park uh, was a big experiment. And uh, initially there were cypress that were planted uh, all along the edge of the canyon at this point. Um, this is not a very, this is not an area that's conducive for the healthy growth of cypress. They've all died off. And instead it's now um, a wonderful collection. And I think it includes all of the different species of the Araucarias. Um, so in addition to gardens, there are collections in, the, um, in Balboa Park that are interesting to know about. This is an old image um, because the next point after the Cypress Point was Redwood, was the Redwood Circle and the, um, these redwoods were maintained for a approximately a hundred years. Um, during that time, they were probably half the size of uh, redwoods that are in their own uh, beneficial habitat. Uh, when we had the drought, the order came that they needed, we needed to cut off the water. The water was cut off and the trees, which were already having a hard time, failed. So we had a donor uh, who helped us to take down a number of these redwoods. We have saved the wood and the wood is being used for projects in Balboa Park. Um, we're working with, uh, it's another program called Tree, um, Trees to Treasures. So we've saved the wood 
Um, but unfortunately, this was another experiment that we tried as hard as we could for 100 years, but it didn't exactly work. Was, this is not the right climate for those plants. And there are other native trees that are being planted in this area. Moving south, um, it, if you've come in the Laurel Street exit entrance to the park, I'm sure you're familiar with the bowling greens that are used uh, every weekend, uh, very active area in the park. I'm not sure if you know that just to the north of the, the Bowling Greens, there's a stand of palms. They're Hesper palms. Um, the seeds for these palms were actually gathered by Kate Sessions on a trip that she took with Dr. Brand Digii. Um, and so these palms are from her, the seeds that she planted. I'm not sure how well they'll fare with the palm weevil, um, but where they have been designated as uh, the, the Kate Sessions palm grove. So. This is the intersection of Balboa Drive and uh, Laurel, which becomes uh, the drive through uh, Balboa Park. Um, again, this image was when Mission Hills Garden Club uh, adopted the, the, we call it the Four Corners area and planted it uh, for the exposition, for the centennial of the exposition. They did a beautiful job um, obviously the annuals are not there anymore, but the roses are still a feature of the Four Corners area, which we're very excited about. Here are the gentlemen that you saw before. This area is called Founders Plaza. And um, this area is being is an adopt a plot that's being cared for by the San Diego Master Gardeners. There have been some real issues in this area. Um, for two years, the Master Gardeners during COVID were not allowed to come out and work in the garden, but they've been working actively more recently. And um, they're currently developing uh, a plan to replant um, this area. So uh, it's, it's quite a dramatic area and it's kind of fun to walk around. Unfortunately, there are a, there's a tremendous ground squirrel infestation there because there is a, um, a fountain and the, it's, um, it's very attractive to these little creatures. Across the street is Kate Sessions. Um, both the, both the uh, sculptures in for the founders and Kate Sessions uh, were designed by a sculptor. Her name is Ruth Hayward. And um, Ruth, I was involved with this very early on. I felt very privileged to be at the, um, at the foundry when Kate was being uh, created forward. And Ruth had asked me, she said, what's a really tough plant that I, I want Kate to have some plant, some kind of a plant. So I gave her um, some of my Echeveria. So again, this is very personal to me. Those uh, little things that look like pine cones in her basket are actually Echeveria from my garden. So, um, we're gonna proceed now to the south and the east. Uh, these are probably more areas that you're not as familiar with. Um, there's a whole area by the park administration that used to be part of the old Naval Hospital. Tweet Street is uh, exceptional um, and will just move through a few of the other areas that people are not as familiar with, with Balboa Park. So moving on, 
behind the administration building, there's a lovely quiet area in the park um, that includes uh, these wonderful kind of um, chaos areas. Uh, there, there are fountains there, uh, little hidden fountains. Um, you have to you have to explore in order to find these. And then there's Tweet Street. And Tweet Street is separated from the rest of Balboa Park by the five. So it's a tiny area. It, it would be called a pocket park. Um, and uh, it's, it's at Date Street between I'm not sure exactly. It's around 11th, 11th and 12th. But if you go up Cortez Hill, uh, it's just a few blocks long and it has this wonderful whimsical motif um, about birds, about, um, and it's inclusive of dogs. The park is only maybe maybe 10 feet wide and there are lots of little tiny bird houses up on posts and it's really quite fun. So um, it's, a, it's a neat area. Moving to the south, uh, if you come off the five, uh, toward Pershing Drive, um, the intersection at Florida Canyon and Pershing Drive goes up 26th Street. And 20, at the base of the hill is uh, a beautiful, beautiful oak grove. And it's actually uh, one of the designated areas in Balboa Park. Um, it's been supported by the Daughters of the American Revolution. Uh, I've forgotten the year, but the USS Bennington uh, actually was the, it was the worst non-combat naval disaster. And it happened in, um, in San Diego Harbor the boiler blew and um, it resulted in the deaths of, of many sailors. So the grove was planted in memorial to these sailors uh, that perished uh, with the demise of their ship. So it's the, it's the Benning, USS Bennington Memorial Grove at the base of Florida Canyon and uh, the it was suffering for a while, um, but has, with some care, has come back. And um, there is a, a new a planting of new trees to support uh, the growth that's there currently. Um, so unless you knew it was there, you probably wouldn't even notice it, but it's a, a nice, um, element in our park, nice historical element. Up above the grove, the oak trees would be to your right, is the area called Golden Hill. Uh, Golden Hill, for a long time, I thought Golden Hill was Golden Hill because all the rich people lived there. There were old uh, mansions up on the top of the hill. But, it, but Kathy Poplava many years ago informed me that it was called Golden Hill because the golden acacia were planted all on the top of the hill. And when they bloomed, the entire top of the hill was in gold. And we're hoping to get some of those acacias back in that area again. It's more like a neighborhood park. You have to know it's there in order to go there. There are no museums, but it's, it's a lovely park space. And one of the things that's there is what was the first hardscape feature in Balboa Park. Um, it's a grotto. Um, 
Nancy Carroll Carter did a wonderful job in uh, doing the research on the history of the grotto. And there was not a lot that she could find about this grotto, but it was the first hardscape feature. It's in the old arts and crafts form. These are the stairways that go down into the grotto and it has this um, fountain feature at the base. Um, for many years, it was covered over with ivy and, and plants and people actually forgot that it was there, but the Boy Scouts were able to clean it out. Um, and it's, it's just one, it's a really quirky place that not many people know about unless you live in that neighborhood. Uh, there's an entire golf course that's included in Balboa Park. And I know that there are probably a number of native trees in, uh, in the non-playing areas of, of the park, the non, um, I don't know what you call them, um, the non-grass areas of the park. And those go back up into Switzer Canyon. And what I really wanna feature today um, is Bird Park. Bird Park is at the extreme northeast corner of Balboa Park. So uh, I got this from Google. You can see uh, Yupa Street and Pershing Drive and 28th Street. And uh, you can, I can do it with a cursor. This is in the shape of a bird. And it has a lot of really fun features. Um, this is the artist's conception of it. And along, you see the beak of the, of the bird is uh, at the intersection of Pershing and 28th and Upas. Um, a number of years ago, we planted the plants in the beak of the bird were all things that birds eat or, um, or attract insects that birds eat. Along the back of the bird, along here, are um, birds of San Diego. They're sandblasted. The names are all sandblasted along the, the um, back of the bird. This funny little area here is the gizzard of the bird. It's teaching kids about how birds digest their food. And although this isn't in the same configuration because this was done quite some time ago, the feathers of the bird are what are being adopted by the um, CNPS. And it's what we've been working on for the last year, year and a half at least, yeah. So we're very excited about this area because not only um, do we have the bird features in the park, we're actually attracting birds to Balboa Park in this area. And this is a recent picture. Um, this feather of the bird was planted just in December a year ago. And as you can see, it's really thriving. We're very excited about it. Um, here's another image of it. And there's a, um, there's a dry stream bed. Uh, that was included in these two feathers of the bird. And as you can see, this was taken just a few days ago after the rain, the dry stream bed is working. I have another image. This was when, this was when it was first planted and we had a very heavy storm. And as you can see, um, it's very, very effective. And we're quite thrilled about it. Um, we have plans, uh, the, the group, um, oops, uh, I, don't, I don't have images of the next feathers that we're gonna plan, but the idea is that we will plant one feather at a time. And as that gets established, then, then there'll be less time work on the ones that are already established as we start to plant uh, the new feathers of the bird. And our last project, was um, just seeding, uh, putting seeds in an area uh, that where 
not, you know, that we're not doing the serious planting in yet, but hopefully some of those seeds will be coming up and we'll have wildflowers in the next feather of the bird. Moving uh, east again down Upas, uh, there's plantings uh, in the uh, entrance to Morley, Morley Field and all the sports complex that's there um, that are very nice. And uh, a little bit to the west of that entrance, uh, you'll see a number of trees. This whole area up until a few years, uh, uh, probably about a decade ago, uh, were all eucalyptus. And that grove failed. It failed a few trees at a time and then a few more at a time. And um, the area uh, has been designated for a collection. This is an amazing collection of ficus. And they're ficus from all over the, all over the world, all different shapes. It's going walking through it and looking at the differences of one particular species is really really fascinating this is just these are just two examples of two different ficus they're very different plants they're very different sizes they're very different shapes but they're both definitely ficus and just below the tenants courts uh, is the California native plant demonstration area. Um, this area is, uh, is a little bit sad right now, but it, it has been really quite wonderful. And um, I'm sure we'll get to it again, um, but it was the first designated native plant area in Balboa Park. Um, it's to the west of the tennis courts uh, just before uh, Dog Park. And this really isn't a garden, but I wanted to share it with you. Um, this is uh, an area behind the tennis courts. It's called a nature play area uh, where all kinds of natural materials are gathered in this area and kids come and they can move things around and build things and um, just be creative with natural materials. It's a wonderful concept and getting, people, getting kids close to nature again. And this is where we are now, um, but there are lots of things to come in the future. We're in the process of restoring the botanical building. Uh, we, there's, uh, efforts that we will need to do to redevelop Palm Canyon. It needs work now. Uh, we have uh, someone who's interested now in helping to refresh an Australian collection uh, in the park, which um, desperately needs some help. Um, Friends of Balboa Park uh, purchased the carousel from the private owner who wanted to sell it. We wanted to make sure that the carousel would stay in the park forever. So it's now um, under the ownership of the combined organizations called Forever Balboa Park. Uh, the Natural History Museum is planning to landscape all the perimeter of the museum with native plants. I've been on that committee and it's very exciting what they're trying to do. Um, there's trail restoration that's going on. Uh, there's interest in refreshing the Balboa Park Master Plan, which 30 years ago when it was developed, most of the plants that were designated then were uh, semi-tropical plants. Um, we're trying to get them to push to have more native plants and drought tolerant plants in the plan. Um, the East Mesa landfill uh, is uh, undeveloped at this point. And of course I have the adopt a plot and the trees to treasures program, which are ongoing programs. And there we are, that's the end. Thank you.